This podcast is brought to you by GA Sports. GA Sports is home of the O'Connor Slitter, Ireland's number one hurling ball used by 311 clubs nationwide. Hello and you're welcome to this week's Backdoor Hurling Show. Delighted to be joined by Kieran Joyce and Joe Fortune. Um, better news this week, obviously, that there's going to be some sort of Hurling Championship, so we're going to talk about that first, then move on to Cork Hurling, and then pick the greatest Cork Hurling team of the last two decades. Um, but first, Joe, I'll start with you. Um, it's great to have Club Hurling back, but there seems to be a few issues now between the club and county scandal again. Yeah, and, and the funny thing is that we're not, you know, let's, let's be real about it, that technically we're not back till 29th, um, and I suppose the, the idea is there now that county board in regards to chat, when championships are going to um, but the inevitable is going to happen between, I suppose, the mix between being a club player and being a county and what's going to be a lesson about so, suppose the only thing I'd say on that is, for me anyway, is a club manager and I've been in the, in the bracket of being involved with the 21 for minors, like, we need to be strong on this, if, if we're getting the guidelines that it's the club player time, then it's what it should be. Um, you know, we're not insured. If I go to Valley Bowden tonight, which I'm not, obviously, but if I went to a Valley Bowden tonight, those players are not insured to collect and um, and they're not insured to collect and together until the end of this month. Um, and as a club, I suppose, as an outsider going to the club, manage the club, wouldn't be able to stand over that may arise by masking here and Joyce to go train in a point where he's not for, for a club. I just don't Now, is it okay? Be doing small groups to get on in public parks. Of course, I, I hope there's not going to be. Well, look, maybe it's a small team. We're expecting, but not going to be a mass or it's county in a couple of weeks anyway. When we're trying to amalgamate lads back into a club set in terms, we'll be starting back to point, um, this month. We'll get the non contact stuff done for a couple of weeks. Do you know, I just think it's very clear from the GA's point of view of where in the county start back. If they start back and before the designated time that they are allowed, those players are not a sure in the county. Um, and that would be, I suppose, from a health point of view, we're going to right with Ali Bowden. Will that lead us to win a county championship? You'd hope so, but you can't promise it. But I, I could, we're not doing it. That's not right for my. I don't think, and I would hope that, that there's some sort of, you know, what's right when it comes to looking for players from a perspective. Don't get me wrong, I realize that Liam Sheedy's and, and Matty Kenny's and Brian Cody's have to get their county set up in order. It seems to be quite clear for the GAA that there's a designated time for those teams to go back training, the same way as there is for my team to go back training. Um, and that's what I said. And Kieran, it's more than likely going to happen where a lot of counties are going to go back before the 14th of September, realistically, really. Yeah, um, I think it is. You hear the stories of <laughs> certain counties going to be played a club championship off in, off in a shorter period than that um, designated. Um, and, you know, that means then you're giving the county more time to prepare. Um, I suppose... Um, as Joe said there, look, it's the guidelines are set out. Um, it's up to the county board, I think, to back the club and to obviously, um, obviously negotiate with the managers and and the county team that look, these are the guidelines these are abiding by. You know, there's a, there's a certain period of time, a three month period that the club championship is going to be played often. Um, if you go, if you're going to support the county manager, then you're going to be looking kind at of shortening that period for the clubs. But then how is that going to um, how is that going to go with the clubs as well? You know, obviously certain, certain clubs are going to be finished up earlier. Certain county players could be finished earlier than they're not allowed to make the semi-finals and finals. Um, but yeah, look, I've heard rumours of, you know, of, of teams and that kind of thing and, and, and training set up and everything for, for a period when clubs are involved as well. So it's a grey area. Um, it all has been a grey area. Um and it, it depends on the power of the county board and depends on the power of the manager as well and the influence of, of the of the manager in terms of will you get players from clubs at certain periods of time. Um, so look, it, it's it's a saga that's going to rage on. It, it, as we said, we haven't even started back training yet and you know we're hearing about it already, which 
probably not a good thing. But um, it's always the age-old debate, you know. Um, it, I suppose if, if you went four weeks ago from now, you know, we're in a lot better position. At least we're going to have a championship. You know, it's going to be shorter, obviously, but it is going to be a championship. But I suppose how it's going to balance out, it, it is dependent on how much the county board are going to enforce the guidelines issued. Um, certain county boards will. Other county boards probably won't. They'll probably side with the county manager. Um, and it'll be up to the clubs and obviously to, to make it up. So, look, it's depending on each county, obviously, but uh, yeah, it's certain counties will abide by it, other counties won't. You know, you know what you'd love as well, Paul? Is you'd probably love, uh, maybe this again is, you'd love a, a, a sense of communication between a county manager if, if that's the role or role they're going to go. You'd love that communication. There's whatever, uh, well, 16 teams in Dublin at, at senior senior A level. You look at that conversation where a county manager picks up the phone and says, "Listen, you know, is there some way we can work this out that, that both teams can, you know, that, that that we can both make sure we get the best of our players?" But I go back to that point. Look, the guidelines are there. The GF set out the guidelines four weeks ago. We were, you know, the three of us were for a bit. Of they are now. If the guidelines are there for a reason. I think the county board should be able to make once the club game has to be seen to be as important because you know when are these all Ireland championships off in October, November, December? You know, it just as a club manager, it's hard for me to kind of perceive that you're going to have a fight now again after the four we've locked up straight into another argument about having players. It's been termed to a step have them. I was just just back with you again, Kieran. Like thing here into county managers are going to have to respect is you can't have a expect a player to be in your county if he's preparing for a county semi-final his main focus should be the club is this where county boards should implement some sort of fine uh, if counties do break the record of taking their players back when they're involved in the club championships they, they will, yeah, I suppose, but it, it this shouldn't be, I suppose, it should be coming from GA itself, you know, um, in terms of strict guidelines and in terms of what what sanctions could be imposed if if these if these rules are broken. Um, if if you're basing this on the county board to to find and regulate, you know, certain managers that kind of stuff, that's that's that that probably won't happen, you know. That's that's uh, because the, the most county boards and most management, senior management, uh, are working kind of hand in hand with each other um, to a certain extent. Um, yeah, look, it's it's. I know, I know. Look from a, I suppose from our past in Kenny and when I was under Brian Cody, he um, Cody always a club man, always a strong village man, always has been. Um, he always, I suppose, we all the structure church membership that. We let's say you, you go through your rounds in your championship. You let's say you might win the semi final, win your Leinster final, and then you're back to your clubs for two weeks. You know you have a week to train with your club, prepare with them, then you play your match, and you're back into it again. You know that was all as outlined at the start of the year. You know, and those were never really broken, unless we had a, a situation where you had a replay, or it went to um, another another week with the county or something like that. So that might that might end up cancelling the game or something like that. But it was fairly clearly communicated and it's, it's been abided by you know so there's a good respect level there um you know is that is that in all in all other county it's hard to know um i suppose kilkenny have the added benefit that it's only mainly hurling you know they're not they're not dual county um like the so galway or cork like so them that have to manage the football and hurling um especially any of the dual strong clubs uh, even with dublin as well and and, and valley Boden, uh, you know like that's that's gonna be another you know another challenge as well, especially in the shorter time period, um, and then ultimately you have to look at the player as well here. You know, like this player is going to be going back, and this player is going to be going hell for leather now in club championship, um, and then they're going to be going straight into hell for leather then for all Ireland championship. You know, so and how you manage the players as well, um, and you know, I suppose both an awful lot of talk coming out as well from certain strength and conditioning coaches and, and everything like that. That you know, players going back in playing matches that I suppose let us say haven't had the preseason that they would. Usually, um, are they looking after themselves or getting the right conditioning? You might have, you might end up with count players back to counties that might have legal, might have injuries, um, and will will county teams get their get their best fifteen, uh, the best championship and the, and the and the best players that we want to see, um, if it's all been rushed forward. So, but so many permutations, and because it's the first first time we've ever experienced this sort of um, 
championship and it's going to be a shortened championship. But things are going to go wrong. Um, we'll, we'll obviously see lessons from it in the end, but I suppose it's 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 hoping to see how it goes along and, and be hoping that the championships get played out in the right manner and then we can look forward to the All-Ireland Championship. Yeah, and Joe, uh, we'll just take Ballyboden for an example. Say Conal Keeney, you have, he's playing football in Hurling. Um, if the groups do stay the same in the Dublin football in Hurling, that's probably, and say you go all the way to the county final in both, that's five games in each. Uh, playing 10 weekends out of 12 weekends, like that's extremely demanding, and, but I don't think they can do it any other way, really. Wouldn't be a bad headache to have, though, would it? I'd bite your hand off for it now. <laughs> no, look, you're right, and I suppose I knew that when, when I was going into a club like Bowden that there's so strong football ways as well. You know, in, we won a, a county final, and, and last year they won a county final and went on to the Leinster final as well. So, look, they're synonymous codes to, to a certain extent, but you're right. I think, Paul, what you have to remember We've probably got ten dual players um, in some capacity, um, and what that will going to be ten weeks to, to talk at the moment is that the Dublin Championship will, will have a group into the final, no quarter final. Um, so the top will win. Um, so if you have a group, we have a group with Kim McCord, Craig Kieran, and um, Scully Connell. So only one team will come out of that group. Um, so look. Yeah, it's it's going to be it's going to be a big task for for some of those like Connell and Simon Um, you know, we we we've we've quite a, a significant crew of dual players there. That's going to come down, I suppose, to myself and Anthony Rainbow to make sure to manage it somewhat. But that can be really done, Paul. If, if we're playing teams like we will if we play our first championship, you know, if you if you do that as a manager, then you're you're sitting at home on tender hooks following Sunday waiting for for the footballer. That's the way it's always been. To be honest with you, like you said at the start of this, if it was, if you guarantee us two county finals, myself and Rainbow will be happy enough now. <laughs> That's it. Moving on to Cork, Ireland. Um, Kieran, 2013, uh, they knocked you out in the quarter final. Um, it was obviously very pleasing that day. Well, very pleasing for Cork that day to knock you out. Henry Shefflin sent off. Yeah. What was it like to be involved in that game? Um, yeah, that was quarter finals, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, um, remember it was it was in Torles, I think it was played. Um, I remember Henry got an early yellow, um, and the ref in question, obviously, uh, <laughs> he got a second yellow fairly quickly afterwards. Um, and yeah, look, it, it, it changed the tie of the game, uh, big time. Um, that day, look, Cork with his Cork, you know, they were flying it, they were. Was the likes of Seamus Harnes, a few of these lads were, were starting to starting to show and become prominent. Conor Lahan, they were moving, they were quick. Um, and they kind of, I suppose, with the extra man, they kind of ran us ragged. Um, and that, and look, we weren't we weren't up to our, 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 ourselves anyway, even though we got a couple of goals and, and got us back into the game a bit. But ultimately, look, we didn't have enough to, to, to push on. Um, and that, so look, yeah, that was this point near, and sure, I think they went on to the the All Ireland final that year, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, and that would look, it was it was a uh, disappointing, a disappointing year how how it ended for us. Um, obviously, we were we were trying to retain or keep going, I think, for the three in a row that year. Um, but uh, look, that day, you know, you, you kind of know the, the writing's on the wall, and likes of Henry goes off um, so early, and then. Look, the game just wasn't going the way we wanted it to go. You know, certain chances to come up, we didn't take them. And um, look, we we keep fighting to the very end, but I suppose everything that Cork struck that day went over the bar. You know, it's just one of those games that you know yourself that about probably about five or six minutes to go, no matter what, you're, you're probably not going to get the, the right result. Yeah, and just touching earlier on in the 2000s, Joe, obviously two in a row for Cork in 2004 and 2005, you're John Gardner, you're Sean O'Calpeen, Donald Cusacks, Ben O'Connor, really impressive. They were great years for Cork early on. Yeah, and, and probably came from when like when Newton Chandram became prominent. You know, they had they were their first in 2000, 2001, I think. Um, and it took them a couple of years, two or three years, I think, to, to win a club All-Ireland. And I, I remember reading a, an article before as well, I think it was Pat McCahey came out and spoke about the involvement of a team led to that success from kind of four or five, that kind of time before Kenny went on to win it in 2007. But when you had the Ben and Jerry's of this world, that, that team, 
that was the early 2000s John Ogan, like, they were just a phenomenal team. Like, it brought a new sense of, of movement and a new sense of direction towards hurling as well. Like, their speed of thought and their speed of hurling was phenomenal. But I would put it down an awful lot to like, you know, as successful as Newtown were at the time team with that type of game plan that were used to our game. And look, like all Cork, you know, they're never afraid of that battle, you know. And I think I think if you look even at when you're picking teams, your favourite team, the type of player you're picking, they're, like there are many really good as well, like they're serious, serious players, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I think in the, in the early 2000s, before Kilkenny probably hampered them, you know, in, in whatever, I think it was 2007, it is something that they had an awful lot of success. I, I'm kind of lucky and unlucky enough to be married to a, a high guard boss. Dad is from Cork, um, and Jesus for years they're like they've they've great tradition in the family, you know, massively in the GA, and like Dennis would have his brothers and all. It, it, it felt like nearly every Sunday, you know, because they were coming up in droves all the time, like they're massive supporters of of hurling, and and it felt like for years Cork was just all the time, and now like you're looking at what you'll probably ask it later on, like you're, you're looking at 15 years probably. 40, 15 years since they won in All Ireland, 20 years since they won a minor. Um, and that time of, you know, as much as I loved seeing the Cork lads coming up, you kind of got fed up with them as well coming up every Sunday. You know, they were winning so much and singing their songs and having the pints. And, um, but yeah, look, a seriously, a seriously historic county. You go back to that era 2000 team, it's very hard to give the most from your great Cork team. Remember that good. Exactly. And Kieran, you obviously played in half back line, but like, Huge respect has to be given to Sean O'Halpine. Um, moved to Cork when he was 10, born in Australia. Um, as me, all of them are said, neither of his parents were born in a hurling stronghold for Man and Fiji. So, like, to come over and be the hurler like he is, it's, it's just unbelievable, really. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose he's the carbon copy of, I suppose, where a professional hurler was back in those days, even though those days, what, are probably 10, 12 years ago. Um, he was the ultimate professional at that time. Um, you know, you'd hear rumours of, you know, <laughs> the day after they'd won, uh, I think in the Burlington or something like that, he was out running and all this kind of stuff, you know. So we're most of us to be tucking into the, the, the residence bar again for, for a few points. But, um, you know, uh, he always he always epitomised uh, an athlete, you know. He was, um, even at that stage, you know, from a conditioning point of view, he was a big, strong guy. You know, he could move, he could get around. As you said, look, he didn't come from a traditional hurling background, but like, you know, I even see it there with his, um, I suppose back in the early 90s with his, with his brother Santa as well, you know, big, rangy guy, um, very athletic. Um, I know he went, to, he went abroad over to the rules at the end, but, you know, he was fairly effective for him there for a couple of years while he was there. You know, he was a handful of hurler. Um, I suppose they're just one of these families that they're athletic, athletic build players and they can adapt to any sort of game. So I say Sean Oak took up, uh, I know he, he played football as well. He went international rules as well. So, he, you know, he, he, he can do any sort of sport. You know, he's that sort of player. He has that sort of dedication um, and I suppose longevity as well. You know, he's been there for, he's there for so many years. Um, so, and he always kind of performed. You know, he was always a foot two man no matter what happened. So that's down to probably just the character he was and what he brought every day. There was obviously lots of issues in Cork as well during the 2000 show. 2002, there was a strike, uh, strike again in 2007, of the 2007-2008 season. So, like, there was issues early on in that Cork side and really think things Cork supporters do not want to see at all, like, what went on there. You know, but, uh, yeah, true, but, like, was, they're, that type of, they're that type of character as well, aren't they? You know, they have a, I think, no matter whether you play it, challenge game or a, or a competitive they have that nature that they, they want the best, you know, you know what they have that they, they tend to kind of see themselves as being the bigger character on there. You know, they're, they're synonymous really with the idea that they want higher standards. One thing, I think when you look back at the, the point of the, of the strikes and stuff, you have to ask yourself what the strikes were about and like whether it's right or wrong, looking for better standards than the player. Now, you know, if I go down to Joyce this evening and I set up a training session and it's not good enough and no sitters there and there's no food after training, you know, whatever it might be, it's not planned well enough. I'd expect Kieran to ring me and, 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 and expect of me a higher standard of training because that's what I ask my players. I, I don't want the, the guy at the back of the bus kind of 
about Joe's set right, and if they're not happy or the setup's not right, then no, that's accountability as a player too. You perform on the field, it's every right to come back. To the so, I would say about the Cork lads, and they were very, they were very venomous, was in ways towards what they wanted. Maybe, maybe rightfully so on the basis that they wanted a better standard for themselves. And remember, Paul as well, they backed it up. You know, they went on strike in in 2002, I think, and then ended up winning a couple of our learns maybe in four and five after that. Where that's really important because if you look for the best and you expect the best off the field, then you have to cross that white line and and know then when you cross the white line, uh, rather than just you know if you want the best for yourself, you know, go for the fans, whatever it is after training, you have to be willing to put in that performance as well. And, I, I'd, I'd commend them to some degree. Um, it's ironic now, maybe, in that they haven't had success for 20 years at minor, and they've gone back to probably two years at a time to take over their minor team in Hogan and uh, and um, and Sean Oak. You know, so you know they, they obviously see guys demand standards, uh, they expect standards, and I and I wouldn't I wouldn't condemn them as a group of players. I've, I've seen what it's like if if you see a county setup that's not right, set up that that drags people down and doesn't expect. And doesn't get the best of players and ends up losing players. It it, it can take a long time to recover from it. And, and I think from the from the Cork players, when they did go on strike, um, they tended to back it up. After. Um, and you see how was how when you listen to Don Logue speaking, whether you know whether you like him or not, he's passionate about you know where he's from. So passionate to have. And I think they will end up having success again with the right people involved, but. I just think sometimes if you're in a situation like that and you're not, and you see what bad setup can do um, to a team or, or to a county team, um, it leads to a problem that can kind of fester for an awful long time. Then 2013, um, obviously beaten by Clare in the replay at Shane O'Donnell's three goals. But the first day, Kieran, is probably one they feel they left behind on Donald O'Donovan's last minute equaliser and like yeah. great players that have passed by like if take for instance Pat Cronin like what a servant he was for Cork early yeah absolutely uh, I hurled a path for a few years down UL so uh, really nice guy quiet guy big strong skillful lad so you know he was he was there on Cork team for years and um, actually I, I remember that all Ireland so well because I think uh, Patrick Horgan had put the ball over the bar and they're about two minutes into extra time and they ended up getting a sideline over under the, I think it was under the Cusick, over near the hill corner. And they went they went to take a, sorry, they went to, um, I forget who took it now, but um, he went to try and put over the bar. But he went out dead, where if they had to keep it in play and maybe run down the clock a bit more, it could have been a different story that year. So he, he took the sideline again. out quick. What's that? That's the Kenny coming out and Joyce now again straight. <laughs> No, um, but like, you know, that, you there was ter- ter- 30 or 40 seconds there that they panicked. Your man went for the went for the, the Hail Mary with the sideline, went out dead, long puck out down, Donald O'Donnell over the bar and whistle blown, you know. So, and then the next day, obviously, then Shane O'Donnell made his his entrance to the to the inter-county scene uh, in a big way. But uh, yeah, like that day, like, even at that day, I suppose Clare would have deserved a draw after the way they played. It was, it was an epic game, but... Yeah, look, I would, you know, you, you'd feel sorry for the likes of, for, you know, for Pa and that kind of thing, you know, because that was that was a that was a tough loss to take um, at that time, and uh, especially when, you know, I suppose they were in control at that stage. You know, they they could have controlled how that game ended, and um, you know, it, it didn't happen for them. And you know, we all remember the ones we lost. You know, that's that's the big thing, no matter what. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it was a great game, epic game. And they've had some great players. And and speaking of Pa, you know, I have I have him on my on my team there because I've I've much respect for him because he, even when I played on my college level, you know, we won a Fitzgibbon there my last year, and uh, Pa was synonymous there. He big Paul used to get up and win. Now he went around with a hurley, was like a goalie hurley. Yeah, so I don't know. He, he, his touch is always good. Like you know, he's one of these lads like like Chinners and all these lads with the big bossy hurl. So, but um, you know, a gifted hurl, he's very quiet kind of guy. You know, um, got a big business. Uh, you never really hear from much of him in the media or any of that sort of stuff. But um, you know, he's some servant for for Cork down to the years. And the managerial situation, uh, Joe Kieran Kingston, manager, then John Myler, Kieran Kingston come back. It's, it's a bit of a strange one that Kieran Kingston has come back, but he did do a great job 
with Cork Ireland when he was in charge. But I suppose just not getting the All Ireland is the big one for this Cork team, really. It is, yeah. Look, it, it, the way you look at it, I suppose, no matter whether people like it or not, in Dublin, like there, there's a trinity there of and, and Cork. Like, like they were always the top three team when it came to, when it came to hurling. Uh, was they're hurting now with I don't find it strange really him coming back to be honest. I players really like them. Um I I don't know he, he got an element of success from them. Um he seems to have put a, a good setup in place. I, I'd never worry really too much, you know, if if the players buy into a guy like, like Kingston and you know they're happy with him and they know that the setup is good. Um you know if, if we've spoken about this a couple of times um over the week that you know Maybe they see that he has that extra bit to get them over the edge again. Um, I think going to somebody new, you're starting all over the same group of players. Um, you know, I, I think like was was John Myler successful uh, to a point? He probably was. You know, it, you know it's it, what is success in Cork for me? I don't know. If I'm happy with just a month. Of uh, same way as you know, if you if you hand a Kilkenny lad a, a Leinster final, I just don't know if it's enough. Um, whereas some counties might you're um, I think they're they're now after looking at the strategic review and they're looking at who they're going to put in place. You know, every element from from probably 15, 16 upwards seems to have um, a very strong character, a very strong message. So they're obviously looking at the future um, and they're looking at trying to get that short term success, which which as a historic hurling count, you know, they expect of themselves all. The time, you know, um, so, yeah, I don't think it's strange him coming back. I, I, I think they have him properly. We didn't really get to see too much of them this year in for the latter stages of the league. And I suppose we, we, we look kind of get to, to judge Kingston when it comes to, to 8th of October, November. Kieran, 3 to 6 seems to be the biggest issue in this core team. We've seen Robert Downey there in the early rounds of the league, impressed. Then we've seen Owen Cadigan for a few games. Mark Ellis last year doesn't play the first round of the Munster Championship in the stands, then comes back for the next game. Tim O'Mahony plays centre-back, then plays centre-forward, full forward. So really, for this core team, they need to get a secure three and six. They do, yeah. And uh, look, I was, I was surprised, I suppose, Mark Ellis is there for a couple of years. Um, you know, and I think he had established himself as a, as a good centre-back. Obviously, form might dictate that, that he obviously hasn't got back to a steady down position. Um, what do you get from from Cadigan? You know, only give you everything. He's he's tough. He's raw. You know, when you need him to be, um, you know, he's he's that sort of player as well. So fullback. So I don't. Know, I I think it's a bed down period as well. You know, um, I I do think chopping and changing your three and six. Um, I suppose it, it it's the spine of your team. You, you probably need to you know. Um, get a normalised team around it because look up on the wings you know you have very very strong young good players um, but yeah look I suppose they, they have struggled the last number of years consistency I suppose is the key here you know there's no stable three and six for them they have been chopping and changing a bit um, so look but there's there's loads of young lads coming through you know there's some very exciting young players coming through they're underage now they've they've kind of upped their game there the last number of years um, and that's so you'd be hoping so and even look when you look at the Fitzgibbon there as well you know there's a couple of serious players coming through again um, down UCC so look all the ingredients are there um, I suppose the biggest thing is for Cork maybe the last couple of years they've been chopping and changing for managers so much that I suppose uh, a, a team or a squad haven't really bedded down for a couple of years you know and um, especially with Munster being so fierce you know and he could be out within First one or two games, if it don't go right, like you know, they don't really get the opportunity or the chance to, to do that, you know. So um, I do think, look, they have underachieved, you know, from from where they have been, and obviously, as you said, we're talking twelve or fifteen years for an All Ireland as well, which is a long, long time for Cork. So you know, things have to change there, and um, you'd be hoping you'd love to see the likes of Patrick Cork and a few players like that getting a, getting an All Ireland for where they go. And Joe, quite simply, Patrick Horgan is probably one of the most unluckiest players not to have an All-Ireland for his performances in the last few years. Standout performance, Kilkenny last year in the All-Ireland quarterfinal, scoring 3-10. Yeah, he is. And it's, it's you know, it's, I suppose they said the same for, for Joe Long. He hadn't got one. And look, Horgan has just been so unlucky. Um, but unfortunately, doesn't you know? Even in, I suppose you look at the likes of the hurlers that's made and if you, you've got Jungfella down in the Conway, that's not 
uh, uh, you know, her and all Ireland, but there are boys there that just have been so, so unlucky. Phenomenal player, great with his own ball, you know, and he constantly performs at the highest level. And as a manager, uh, I suppose Kieran would say the same thing. If you go onto the pitch and you look at the guy beside you know that every game he plays, he's he's constantly at the top. It's, it's a great player as a manager to know how he's going to perform for your The big problem is he doesn't always have the support. Of him. You know, he has great players around him, not the kind of support that's constant. Oh, there was no point, I suppose, if you look at all the great teams, when you, when you had Henry at his best, he still had the likes of Larks and those last on the that hard work for him. And, and unfortunately, it's just where Horgan hasn't had it. It's not done for him yet. I, wouldn't, I, I still think in the next couple of years, I wouldn't write him off yet. And um, a real characteristic of uh, this court team, Kieran, is they want to bring teams into a shootout and they have the forwards. Your Shane Kingston's, even Dara Fitzgibbon coming from midfield, Patrick Horgan, who we touched on. But do they just lack that? A bit? bit of aggression in the defence, do you think? Um, yeah, I, I, I suppose. I always associate Munster Hurling as, um, you know, it's going to be 34 points to 32, you know, it's going to be a spectator sport. Are they as tight in defence as, as you would be, maybe you'd get to the All-Ireland Series, probably not. Um, it is, as you say, it's a shootout. Um, yeah, look, I suppose the last couple of years, a couple of the key mistakes that go that, that Cork made, you know, against Galway a few years ago, um, you know, even against ourselves, you know, it's just a couple of key moments where they switched off, where, let's say, overlaps or overruns come in and goals are scored, you know, and is that due to lack of experience maybe? Yeah, absolutely, you know, they have a young team. A um, couple of errors, I suppose, made as well, you know, and sort of look, they were unfortunate as well. You know, certain players getting sent off at the wrong time, you know, in certain matches as well, you know, for silly challenges, all that kind of stuff. That all went against him for, for a number of years. What is that? That's obviously lack of experience as well. Um, maybe a bit of panic as well setting in. Um, but look, there's, there's a combination of a lot of things there. But I do think, um, like you even see now, like the likes of this Limerick team now coming, right? Limerick's Achilles is Cork because Cork will play the way Limerick play. You know, they'll play fast, free flow and hurling and they'll do them damage, you know, like certain teams will, will set up against other teams and, you know, would we fear playing Cork? No. Um, would we fear playing Limerick? Yes, at the moment. But would Limerick fear, fear playing Cork at the moment? They would, you know, because the way they play, you know, um, so you know yourself, if you're going to let Cork um, play like St. Patrick Organ, you get one one ten or two twelve uh, in a game for you and a big game. You know you know yourself you're going to have to be scoring at least two twenty two twenty five to have any chance of beating Cork. You know on their day. So um, yeah, look, I, I I think that that is a thing that they'll have to maybe address themselves. You know to win all Ireland you can't be conceding that amount either. Like you know you look at the likes of the tips, the Kenny's there, even the Galways there. The last couple of years they've won all Ireland. You know their defence has been has been their their, their main rock to get it through in the end. Um, and and that, but uh, look, it, it's an area they have to look at. Um, I suppose they have, they have a lot of experience there still, in the likes of Nash and that in the back. And you know, as we said, Owen there, there's a lot of experience coming through. You know, they should be able to gel a team around the youth coming through as well. Um, and as I said, look, they, they have maybe one or two big games a year. Um, you know, is there consistency there year in, year out? Probably not for the full, let's say, five or six matches at Tinita. I suppose that's probably the one thing that they'll have to look at. You know, they could be fantastic for two two matches of a year and then for another two matches, you know, we always say, you don't know what sort of Cork team is going to show up, you know, and everybody says that, you know, because, you know, one day they're fantastic, other days are just off, way off, you know, and where they get that consistency and that um, week in, week out um, mentality and play, and, you know, they're a dangerous team, they'll, they'll take anyone, you know, but... Uh, yeah, and, and, and look, that's probably something that Kingston probably knows he can get, and that's why he's probably back to do it again. 2017 and 2018, Joe, such tight margins for Cork. Damien Catalan getting sent off against Waterford, but they probably look at that Limerick game. Robbie O'Flynn has the chance, and Nicky Quay just makes that flick like the finest margins you could really get in them semi finals. Yeah, and and we've spoken, it's, it's funny, like in the, in the three or four kind of done we've we've spoken about those fights. Um, and sometimes teams Paul can be just seem to constantly be on fine margins. You, know, you see club teams, you see it in 
in teams like Cork as well. Where they just don't seem to get that little bit of luck. Now, I would 100% agree with what Kieran said about it. Look at the call trying to come out as well. Like, they're coming out of a, a situation where you've got, you know, a, a, an amazing Limerick team. You know, you've got a click now that's a redo. You know, you've got a Waterford team under a tough man, um, new manager as well. So, like, you really have teams with hip, obviously, as well. So, you've got teams down, it's cut, you know, and those fine margins are there. I, I, I I don't tend to, and I've said this to you a few times, I, I don't tend to kind of go too much on kind of bad and lucky. I just think some teams need to know how to win. And I think once you learn that um, and once you're you're able to do that, it's just, yeah, is it unfortunate? Yeah, it's, it's sad for teams at times. But I, I just think, look, Cork won 11, Lee McCarthy, they know how to win. It's just It's been a barren, whatever, 10, 12, 14 years for them again. Um, do I think they'll be back? 100%. But they just need to make sure that, that the kind of plans and, and management are in place, that's all. I know Gilly have been a dominant team in the core championship now for the last few years, Kieran. What's your thoughts on these divisional sides? Like, you look at that I'm a Gilly team, nearly every one of them has played for Cork. But the big drawback for this, uh, say, divisional team is they can't represent Cork in the Munster Championship. So when they win county, you're seeing the losers of Cork go into Munster and they seem to be struggling, the losers of the county final then. Yeah, um, I suppose because it's it's always been different um, down below uh, in Cork with, with this. Yeah, and I suppose it, it, it's hard to it's hard to gauge because obviously you're not involved in that sort of setup yourself uh, in Kilkenny, but yeah, look, it's um, it's unusual that they can go ahead and win and then they can't represent, you know, and even with UCC, you have so many players that um, have played with UCC and then, you know, they can represent with their club as well. Um, you know, it, it, it's an unusual setup. Um, it is, but yeah, look, the, the, I suppose you can see the benefits to it as well, you know, from a divisional point of view, um, if, 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 if that area... Um, in certain divisions, you know, are not strong enough that, you know, they have to amalgamate clubs and that kind of stuff to, 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 to represent. Um, and then obviously when, when you have a great team, then that, 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 that obviously can get through and win, you know, they can't really represent either. You know, it, it's, it's a tough one. Um, ultimately what you're trying to benefit, you're trying to get probably, probably get some, some very good players in certain clubs to, you know, play with a very strong team uh, and maybe get them to, to experience what it's like to play in, County, you know, semi-finals, finals, uh, and that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, look, uh, being honest, uh, unless you're in it and you're and you're playing it and that kind of stuff, I, I find it hard to, uh, I find it hard to get to grasp it. Absolutely. Now moving on to the best Cork hurling team of the last two decades. We're going to start with you, Joe, and your job was to pick number one to seven. I got the easy one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right um. Look, I think, I look, I'll speak about goalkeeper first. Like, they're, they're obviously not having, not having very good keepers. Like, Nash is there. But for, um, for Don Logue, on the basis that I think he transformed, I, he, he nearly was the start of what Nash had done, and that he transformed that hooker. Um, I think he was before his time in some ways. His passion for Cork, you know, like earlier on, what do you like? We're not his passion for Cork is. Is incredible. Um, now, I suppose when you name the full back line that you'd possibly have in front of him, he, had, he always had six very good backs. Kieran touched on it a few minutes ago. Um, you asked the question, like, what, what are they missing? And they're missing the six I'm going to name to you, I think. You know, they're missing that, that style, that toughness. Um, Don Logue, for me, would stand out, um, you know, closely. I suppose Nash would have been close enough in, in consideration as well. Full back line um, went for Wayne Sherlock. Uh, Again, you know, tigerish, serious pace, um, aggressive in your face. Like you wouldn't want, like you'd know you'd. Um, and he was that that constant performer as well for them. Um, full back. I think there's a question. I think uh, if you ask anybody in the country, you're, you're going to go to rock this. Um, what you asked Kieran the question? What are they missing at six? Like he was, he epitomised what you want in your three. Tough, strong. You know. <laughs> There's a couple of YouTube clips of him still about you know these famous scores where he drives out and he goes to a wall and then Kenny scores to score points as well. 
you, you can't ask. He was just, I, li- I listened to his podcast actually a few weeks ago to Brian Carlos bike one day and um, I was listening to it and again, he has that pure cork about him. You know, he's, everything is just pure about cork and he's really a fella that I, I'd imagine that they, you know, they loved going to the trenches. But then on the other side, I put Brian Murphy in, um, Brian Rovers man, got an all-star, was young heart when he came at the start, um, constant performance, himself, Sherlock and O'Sullivan. Would have spent time in front of Donal Oak as well and a serious full back line. Now, like I said you last week, when you're picking these best teams, you know, there's guys probably shivering their park or two, but um, I put that down as my favourite full back line rather than best, um, and guys that you'd know that want to do the job. Um, then half back line, again for me, like you asked the question, what are they missing? John Oak, one side, do you know, what, what more can you say about the guy? I remember actually coming up with I'm playing with Pats the DCU in a, in a game when, when I was in college. Uh, I remember just standing beside him being an athlete. Oh, just a phenomenal guy. Phenomenal athlete. Um, looked like he was made of stone. like, um, But real, real phenomenal hurler. Again, one of the guys who was probably militant enough at the time in regards to spoke about it recently enough that he was I was not disappointed with, with how it ended but he felt that I suppose that people had to step down as, as a person and as when you look back at it, it was probably hard to hear the book or Curry to step down in order for them to progress. But um, what a wing back. Centre back might be surprised. Like Mulcahy was in my head as well, and I, I kind of, I, I kind of hemmed and hawed, but I went with Brian Corcoran um, on the basis that again, you know what a leader. Uh, you know, and they, like I think with any team, I've been lucky enough to in the teams that I've had over the over the course of being with Bowden uh, and with. And, I've, I've been lucky enough to have very good number six. I think it's, I think it's important for any team to test your three and six. Um, and I think for, for me, like, Parkin has to be there. And you're, you haven't taken one on. on oh, I have actually taken one off. off Joy. One off me last week. Um, we'll see. And then my, my final six. So I had Sherlock, O'Sullivan and Murphy, John Ogg, Parker and John on the other side. Um, John Gardner, for me, I, I think even in those times that I speak about, when you see the Cork team, four, five, and six, he was just somebody who just epitomised the type of game they were playing, on his own ball, you know, throw through uh, forward lines, great delivery of ball as well, and you know, somebody who who just who who really bled red for them, really he laid everything down for them, um, and like what a half back line, John O. Cork and Gardner. You know, and again, it's probably going back to what we, we spoke about earlier on. What are they missing? They're missing probably those kind of characters, those tough guys to win the draft for you and will go to battle rather than you know, looking for the fancy days out as well. Now moving on to you here in uh, number 8 to 15. Okay. Um, okay, so Joe, Joe went for the older, the older crew. Uh, I went for a mix, a mix, a mix of youth and, and a bit of older crew as well. Uh, so number eight had Darif is given. Um, look, phenomenal athlete there. Last couple of years, pops up with nearly four points a game. Uh, covers an acre of ground between both twenty ones, nearly on either side. You know, so I, I think he's a he's a shoe in for me. Um, I have him paired with Jerry O'Connor. Um, obviously, look, Jerry phenomenal back back in the early noughties as well. Um, Similar enough to Darius Gibbon, probably um, as well sort of player. Popped up with a couple of scores here and there. Always got back getting hooks and flicks. Um, very good on breaking ball, um, and was a real little dynamo in midfield. So he's my number nine. Um, number ten, obviously, then has to be Ben O'Connor. Um, ben, look, he's he's he was the go-to man for Cork for years um, before the likes of Patrick Cork came along. Um, very consistent on freeze. All has popped up three or four points a game as well. All has won an awful lot of freeze. Great touch. Uh, ph- phenomenal speed from, from the wings as well. So he's my number 10. Um, number 11, I went for Seamus Harnady. Um, he's been probably Cork's go-to man, I suppose, for you know winning the hard ball for a number of years. Um, very strong in the air. Very strong in the tackle. Um, so I would have him uh, centre forward. Now look, I know it looks like Niall McCarthy and that kind of thing, you know, probably would have been the centre forward back in the day, but I suppose what Seamus brings now, he's he's so quick, I suppose. The problem obviously Seamus has is, you know, 
there's one or two core players on the team, you know, it likes it from Stephen Morgan, see others can win dirty ball. But you know, when you when you have a day that, you know, it's not going your your way, you know, they probably rely overly rely on likes of Seamus to, to win ball, you know, um to to win that, that fifty fifty or that seventy thirty ball that some others might not. Um so number twelve then I went for Pat Cronin. Uh, as I said, look, phenomenal hurler as well. Um kind of uh, sort of lad that, that drifts in and out of games. When he drifts into games, you get to three and four points a game. Um, very good striker, the ball. Big, tall guy as well. Well able to win uh, win, win puck outs as well. So, like, I suppose I have two very good primary ball winners there and, and, and Ben. So that's my number 12. Uh, 13, I went for Patrick Horgan. Um, obviously, that's that's the, that's the shoe in there. Um, Cork's probably best hurler, most consistent hurler, I suppose, in the last... Seven or eight years, you could say. Um, 14, I went for something different. I went for Santo Halpin. So I went for the big lad up for 14. Um, I suppose when I first saw Santo play, uh, I know he only played a couple of seasons. I think he only played two or three seasons. You know, I thought to myself, this guy's going to be a handful. He's big, he's tall, he gets out in front, he catches ball, and he just turns and runs at you. Um, and, you know, that's a dangerous combination for any, any sort of forward um, to be asked that. But, um, and I suppose... Cork's losses, I suppose, he went went abroad, you know. Um, if he'd stay around, you know, things might have been different, might have had more more success, but um I think, you know, he'd be he'd be he'd be some target man to to, to lob ball into because we just lob ball in into Kenny. Um and then obviously fifteen then you, you you can't have a Cork team without Joe Dean. So um you know, it, the man with the L he was synonymous there for years. Um Fantastic touch, you know, for, for a man of his of his um, size, he was able to get around. He was able to win ball. Um, so good on freeze as well, you know. He's look, he was just one of those go-to men, you know, before before the likes of the Patrick Morgan came along uh, for Cork. So that's my uh, that's my 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 eight to fifteen. Well, that's all for part one on the backdoor hurling show this week. Thanks a million for your time, lads. Hello and you're welcome uh, to Paris, the back of our show. Delighted to be joined by Slock Neil Hurleman, Michael McShane. Firstly, Michael, uh, your manager, Slock Neil, you must be delighted that there's going to be some action this year. Yes, indeed, Paul. Um, uh, like everyone across the country, um, I'm delighted that we're going to get back out and, and, and get on to the training pitch and, and in a few weeks' time, hopefully, if everything goes well, and, and things keep improving. We're going to get some championship action because I suppose at the start of the of the lockdown and the start of this pandemic, um, all the talk was there wouldn't be any GAA this season at all, and we would be looking at maybe middle of 2021 before we would see anything, and that was a long, long way away. So yeah, delighted that we're we're now in, in preparation mode to get back out there, and, and, and the weather's been so good. You know, it's uh, the pitches are all looking well, so can't wait to get at it. And I suppose one good thing from a club perspective this year is you're going to have action in July and August and September. Usually you wouldn't have action during these months because of the county season. So you're actually going to be playing club hurling probably in the best possible weather here we have in Ireland. Yeah, the, the, the championship season starting for us is starting about four or five weeks earlier than it normally would. Um, so you would hope that, yeah, we're going to get better weather through the, through the county championship anyhow. Um, there's no plans at the moment for anything happening after that there, and that's really where you get into your winter club hurling. So um, for now, yeah, look, we're going to be starting training in, in, in less than two weeks' time. You know, the sun's shining out of the sky up here the, the, tonight, so you know it's, it's going to be great getting out and at it, and, and hopefully when we, when we do go to play the championship games, the weather holds up, the pitches will be firm. You know, uh, it makes for fast hurling, makes for exciting hurling, and uh, you know, hopefully everybody. I, I just hope that everybody gets the opportunity to go and watch it. I don't know yet what the plans are in, in terms of supporters being allowed to watch games, but I hope that people will get the chance because uh, I know as a GA fan, I can't wait to go and watch games as well as being involved in them, and and so you know, bring it on. And. Obviously, the pandemic has been a huge impact, uh, like for clubs. Have you been doing Zoom sessions with Slock Neil, or have they been? You've been giving them skills to do at home, or anything, or have you just left them alone and they're responsible to do their own thing, really? 
No, we haven't left them alone as such. We, we've set out programmes for them. Our, our, uh, our, our strength and conditioning coach and our, our physical trainers have set out work for them to do. And we try to split that up into different blocks. We give them a break from it then. Um, and then they start it back. And at the same time, we've asked them to, to ensure they keep the, the stick and ball on their hand. There's only so much you can do when you're in lockdown. You're, you're working off the gable end of the house or up and down the garden with your siblings. Uh, but as long as they're doing something, um, you know, we're happy enough. And, you know, from from a point of view as a manager, the Slackney lads are very honest. You know, when you ask them to do something, you know they'll do it. Um, that's what I found with them over the last five years. And I have no doubt that when we get them back together as a group on the 29th of June, that uh, none of them will be carrying too much timber and uh, they should be in fairly good physical shape. But listen, it wouldn't matter, Paul, if you were training seven days a week through the lockdown. It's totally different training on your own and then, you know, going into a situation where you're going to be training on a pitch and there's a lot more twisting and turning and, uh, you know, a lot more flexibility. And there's there's obviously the, the, the worry where we you might possibly have soft uh, tissue injuries from, from doing too much too soon. Add in the fact that Slough Neal are a dual club and they have ambitions to win the, the Derry Football Championship as well, so Hurland, um, then the workload sort of uh, doubles up for them. So we're going to have to be very careful what we do when we get back. But, you know, we hopefully will we have that well planned out and uh, hopefully everyone will go according to plan. And... Michael, how did you get into management? Was it always something you wanted to go into when you were younger? or uh, How did you get into it, really? Um, it certainly wasn't something I'd ever planned to do. Um, when you're a player, you probably look at managers and think, well, I wouldn't want his job for, for, for all the key in China. Um, I got involved uh, in, in a Camogie team, in Derry, uh, a Labby Camogie team, when my... Uh, my my good wife was playing for them and uh, I got involved in the coaching there and, and they enjoyed it and we had a, we had a fair degree of success um, and, and then I moved into to senior management uh, fairly quickly after that and I've just always enjoyed it. I suppose, Paul, the, the reason I enjoy it is it's the second best thing to, uh, to after playing hurling is to be involved in the management or the coaching side of it. Because once you give up your career, I played senior hurling for maybe 18 years, and once I gave that up, um, there's a big hole in your life. You know, you've been it's something you've been used to doing uh, almost your whole 11 days from underage right through. Um, so when you get involved in coaching and management, it's the second best thing. There's the great buzz if you if you're lucky enough to be involved with a successful team. There's the great buzz of winning things. There's the great buzz of looking forward to and being involved in big games. Um, but it's, there's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of time uh, goes into it, especially at the level that we're at with Slack Neil now. Um, it's a year round, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a year round job, and you know I'm putting three, four nights a week into it, up and down the road to Slack Neil. Slack Neil's about fifty minutes to an hour away from where I live. Uh, some days I'm going straight there from work, so I'm not getting home to maybe eleven o'clock at night. I have three young uh, uh, boys at home. So there's days you go really from not seeing them from the morning right through to the next day, and that can be tough. But you know, I, I'm lucky I've got a very supportive wife and supportive family, and and uh, I, I really do enjoy it. So it was it was kind of by default I got involved in it. But now that I'm in it, I'm sort of in uh, up to my neck, and, and I don't know when I'll ever get out of it. <laughs> and like, what's so special about this Slough Neil bunch? We've seen them in football get to club finals. You were an inch away last year from an All Ireland club final, which would have been massive for Derry Hurling. Like, what do you put it down to that they're so successful in both codes? Um, there's a number of issues, Paul, and, and I've been asked this so many times. There's no sort of one answer to it. There's a number of factors. One, uh, Slagville have been blessed with a very, very talented bunch of lads who have all come along at uh, at the one time or within the one sort of 10-year period. Um, and you find that in clubs from time to time, they'll have a, a sort of a, a bunch of players who come along here once in a lifetime. Uh, and Slag Neil have, got, have had that, both football and hurling. And there's a, it's well documented there's a massive crossover between the football and the hurling panels. Um, so firstly, they're very, very talented. But, you know, there's the country's full of talented people who don't apply themselves and, and, and who don't make the most of their talent. 
these guys are, you know, they've got a serious hunger to be the best they can be. Um, and to do that, they make all the sacrifices that they have to make. They, they, they train uh, religiously. Um, you know, honestly, and I, and I say this genuinely, there's times I actually have to pull individuals out of training because I can see they're maybe doing too much or they're, uh, you know, they're maybe getting tired, but they don't want to. They want to keep going. They want to keep driving. Um, but for their own good, you have to pull them out, just tell them to take a few days rest. Um, so th their, their work ethic is, is incredible. Their hunger for, for, being, for success is brilliant. And, you know, they're smart. They're very, very smart. They realize they're, they're, they're living in a window of opportunity, which isn't going to last forever. Um, and it's a chance for them to, to win as much as they possibly can in that time frame uh, and with, with each other. Um, and they know that someday it'll all come to an end. It'll, it'll be a gradual come, uh, it'll be a gradual ending, but someday that slide towards it, the end will, will start and they just want to keep driving on and driving on. And, you know, long may it last because the, the, you know, the average age of the team uh, in January when we played Bally Hale was, was just under 24. So I believe that's the best, their best years ahead of them. And like, obviously burnout can be a year when a team keeps coming back year after year. What have you done different to get these players refueled and ready season after season? Well, what you try and do is keep things fresh. Um, we try not to overtrain them. We, we try to give them a break as, as much as we can. It's difficult because probably, you know, we've at the current time we've got, I think maybe there's four of the senior hurling panel are senior county footballers for Derry. So they've got Derry football commitments as well as their club football commitments. And we've got maybe seven or eight lads who are on the Derry senior hurling panel. So when, for instance, when we finished the All-Ireland semi-final, Rather than the guys getting two or three months break, they were straight into playing and training with their with the inter county squads. So it's very difficult, um, but we try to, to to get them enough rest ahead of the championship. So we don't start you know preparing for championship in April or or, or May. Um, I suppose the last few years we've really only got our heads together. We we usually say to them, look, you know, a couple of weeks and two or three weeks in July, that's the period to go on your holidays, get to the sun. You know, let the hair down, enjoy yourselves, and then come back with the batteries recharged and ready to go. And at that stage, then we really get our heads down and start working. But as I say, the the these guys have an uh, an insatiable hunger for for success, and that's what drives them. Um, and and you know, I suppose that and we we monitor them very carefully in terms of of fatigue, and if we if we notice that someone is is starting to 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 look worrisome or their, their stats are showing that they're getting tired. Then we'll, we'll take them out of the firing range for, for a week or two and let them rest up. Maybe just play league games if that's what's involved at that time. Maybe not even play that. But, you know, keep everything as fresh as we can get into the championship and, and then off we go. And you've won seven in a row now, um, Derry Senior Hurling titles. You came in in 2015, you're going into your sixth year. But hard to believe before 2013, Slock Neal's last Hurling title in Derry was... 2000, like the end of the famine there in 2013. Like, is Derry Hurling a real competitive championship, or do you usually find it a bit too easy? No, I don't find it easy at all. Um, look, we've had some, you know, big big victories in the Derry Championship over the last five years. Some facile victories, as you might call them. We've also won two of our semi-finals in the five years I've been there against Kevin Lynch's by by one point and one of them after extra time. Um, Kevin Lynch's are, are are knocking on the door and I've no doubt, you know, if Slockville weren't the team that they were, they would be winning championships. Um, right now, we've got the upper hand on them, but we have to be at our best. We have to be at our best uh, to, to, to make sure that we can come out of Derry. And we don't ever look past uh, the Derry championship, you know, at the start of the season, people start to talk to you about, are you, you know, going back to retain your Ulster title, about going to the national level and a chance of winning all Ireland. We don't think like that. Genuinely, don't we? We think only of the Derry Championship because we realise if we don't, mm -hmm. if we're not successful in our own county, everything else falls away. You know, so you no, know, our focus is always, you know, prepare for the Derry Championship and we prepare for it very seriously. Get through that. 
and then we take what's coming after that. And obviously, three Ulster titles in the last five years has been extraordinary for a Derry club. Like, there wasn't much silverware in Derry before. Do you look back as a manager with great satisfaction that? Because I think people from outside of Ulster uh, don't realise how competitive it is, really. Yeah, look, we, we broke the ceiling for Derry Hurland. No Derry club had ever uh, won the Ulster Club Championship uh, before 2016. Um, 2015 was a real heartbreak. Um, we lost the, the Ulster final to Cushion Doll by a point after extra time. It was probably one of the best hurling games in the country that year. It was a fantastic game. Um, they, they, before I had taken on the job as manager in 2014, they'd lost to Cushion Doll after a replay. Um, they'd lost the 2013 final to, to Lochiel. So, you know, there was a maybe an air of thought that no Derry team could ever win this. Um, but, you know, it was about belief for, you know, it was about trying to instill belief in the guys and just making them realise you've got to keep knocking at the door, keep knocking someday, you'll, you'll get through it. And they, they did, they came back after 2015, the heartbreak and all that they, they endured, they came back, they worked harder um, and then they got the, their just award and it was a massive day for, for Slough Neal in 2016 when we beat Lockheed in the final, but it was a massive day for Derry. Hurland, and it was a massive day for Ulster Hurland because all of a sudden you had another county who had, who, who had provided uh, uh, provincial champions. Um, and once we got over the line once, the first time, then I'm not saying it was easy to win it after that, but the belief was instilled in them. Um, and when they entered the, the championship the following year, they really believed that they could retain their title, not just in Derry, but also in Ulster. Um, and they done that. And then 2018, we just had a brick wall. The guys have been on the road for too long. You know, great success in the football, four Derry titles in a row, two All-Ireland finals. Um, and, and it just, the, the wheels came off the wagon in 2018. But um, again, we freshened things up and freshened up the management team. Um, uh, you know, we came back, took a really good long rest. The fellas hadn't had over the winter. A lot of them went traveling through Europe and, you know, got, had good holidays. And and then and, and we came back in 2019 last year, very, very determined uh, to complete seven in a row in Derry, which was creating a new record, um, but to, to retain or to win back the, the, the Ulster title. And it was very satisfying on both finals last year, the county final to, to complete the seven in a row. And then the Ulster final in Uri when we beat Deloy and, you know, Everybody had us written off going into that and Lloyd game, but we knew we were we were right up in there with a good shout, and and we won it very convincingly in the end. So there was a real coming of age that day for us, and and uh, you know probably that third title was the sweetest of the lot. Um, your probably most disappointing performance in the All Ireland semi final was your game against Kula. Do you feel you learned a lot from a team that day coming up against Kula? Yeah, well, look, Paul, we have a, you know, we have an old saying that we never lose, either win or, or, or you learn. Um, and Kula, to me, was was a great learning experience. As a manager, it was a great learning experience. And I know for the players it was. They realised that day the, the, the level you had to get to. Kula were a fabulous team, you know. They won two All-Irelands in a row. Um, they were they were on, you know, a very, very slick um, operation. But... They were a team that were five or six years in the making. Um, they were riding the crest of their wave. Um, and we came up against them at a time when they were just really, they were at their best. Um, and we were wet behind the years, both as management and as players going into that. We were, you know, players were very young, probably physically weren't ready for that battle against a, a, a Kula. Um, we weren't slick enough. We weren't fast enough. Our touch wasn't good enough. Um, so, yes, we learned lots from it. Um, and we were we were better the following year, but people have to remember that in 2000, February 2017, February 2018, when we played Kula and we played uh, Napiercy in the semi final, we had to contend with uh, you know dual loyalties to the football and the hurling. The footballers were preparing for a football semi final as well, so we only got to do at the very best a half of the preparation that the the opposition we were going in against would have had. So. You know, had we had been going in as a as a single code club against Kula and and, and Pierce, I think we would have 
we would have, you know, shown a lot better than we were. And that was proven in, in January past when we played Valley Hill because we got 12, 13 weeks of preparation for that. Uh, and our hurling, the standard for hurling was the highest it's ever been. Um, so, yeah, to go back to your question, yeah, we, we learned a lot that day, but we learned from every defeat. Now, Piercy, you obviously didn't win the game. You lost by seven points. But to rack up 3-8 against Nipirshi, because, like, if you look at all that Nipirshi team, I think nearly every single one of them has played for Limerick underage teams or senior teams at some stage in their life. But to score 3-8, like, and you, you were right in it uh, just leading up to the end. So that must have given you further confidence to progress on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it was a much improved performance from the year before against Kula. Um, we scored three eight, but we were very disappointed in that. Delighted to get three goals because that was a, it's a serious defence that Napierce had, and, and we cut them open, you know, four or five times in that game. Um, but we, you know, eight points isn't going to win you an All Ireland semi final. You know, if we had added another seven eight points, which we we should have done because we had enough. Shots that went wide that should have been gone over, the shots that weren't under pressure, shots that dropped short. Um, but again, you know, without making excuses, we just weren't sharp enough. We hadn't the work done because of our dual commitments. Um, we also lost two players uh, going into that there, which was never really spoken about. But uh, Shane McWigan was probably our best forward that year. He, he was operating at a really, really high level. And in our last challenge game against Carlo, about three weeks before we played in the Pearson, Shea pulled his hamstring um, and he ended up missing out on it. And I believe if we had had him that day, it would have been a whole lot closer because he was our, he was our best going forward that year. Um, and Sean Casty, who had played in the Ulster final, broke his hand in the same game against Carlo. So just look, you, you need the rub of the green. You need, you need the gods to be looking after you when you go into any of these games. Um, so we, we didn't get the, the, the luck we needed. Um, but again, I, I go back to saying, look, our preparation wasn't the best it could be because of time constraints. And that was shown And eight points. It was a poor return for an All-Ireland semi-final. Moving on then to the Ballyhale semi-final. You obviously look back at that game with a sense of regret leading towards the end. But like possibly the best display ever from a Derry Hurling team. You really put Derry Hurling on the map that day in the general public among Hurling. Um, what was that game like to be involved as a manager? Look, it was it, it was brilliant to be involved in. It's, it's you know when if you're going to be in management, if you're going to be a player, those are the games you want to be involved in. Um, you know the the atmosphere in the ground that day was fabulous. The, the the action on the pitch was fabulous. But look, any given game that, when I'm on the sideline, I don't enjoy it because you're you're too deep in thought. You're, there's there's too many things going on. You're trying to you're trying to keep a cool head, but at the same time, there's a million things, thoughts come through your head. There's there's people shouting things to you from every, you know, other mentors or players shouting from on the field. You're trying to watch what's going on. You're trying to react to the, to the opposition changes they might be making. You're trying to make your own changes to give you an advantage. So it all goes over very, very quickly. It's all like a, a, a quick blur. Um, but when you get time to sit back and reflect and look back, I really enjoyed it, but I had a, a really, really uh, great sense of pride. We had lost. We went there that day to win. We believed we could win. Um, nobody gave us a chance again. Um, we were going up against you know, some of the GA's greatest superstars, both on the sideline and on the pitch. But we actually, you know, we really believed we were going down there to win that day. So there was a great sense of disappointment to have lost the game. But very quickly, there was a realisation of just how much we had proven to ourselves that we can compete with the very best. Because we'd went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ballyheel. Ballyheel are, are the aristocrats of, of, of Club Hurlan. Um, and we we put them to the pin of their collar. And, you know, I'm not going to start graving and, and saying that refereeing decisions went this way or that way. But, you know, there wasn't much between us. Colin Fenley got a goal at the end, maybe made the scoreline look a, a, a bit harsher for, from our point of view but you know Brendan Rodgers got the goal with three minutes to go we had them panicked um, but the great team that they were they didn't panic they kept their cool uh, and they got themselves over the line but as I said to you that was the day I think everybody realised and most importantly the players realised 
we we can go toe to toe with anybody in Ireland. And if that's the case, there's no reason why if we don't keep working as hard as we have been and maybe a bit harder, get a wee bit stronger, get a wee bit sharper, that we can't go the whole way. And obviously, that's your ambition, getting so close to Ballyhale. There's obviously going to be a lot of obstacles in your way, but your main ambition now, I'm sure, as a management, is to get back to an All-Ireland club final because you have some great hurlers in that team. The Jules Stairs, Chrissy McKay, Brendan Rogers. Shane McGuigan, Cormac O'Doherty, like there's some splendid hurlers, as good as some hurlers in the country. Yeah, look, absolutely. Every player in the team is, 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 a, is a it's a class act, and, and, and guys who aren't even making the team, um, which is why they are successful. The four guys you've mentioned there, um, I've no doubt if they were 100% committed to playing hurling, um, they would make any team, and I mean any county team in Ireland, um, the levels they can get to. Uh, Chrissy, Brendan, and Shane are are county footballers, so all the time they're 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 juggling county and club football commitments with their hurling. But they're fabulous players. You know, Brendan Rogers is an unbelievably exciting player. Chrissy has been the linchpin of this team for for more years than I can remember, and a fabulous, fabulous leader. Um, Cormac O'Doherty is probably the most skillful player in Ulster and, and one of the most skillful players in Ireland and we haven't seen the best of him yet but hopefully we will um, and Shane McGuigan really came into his own like, Shane was incredible last year he man marked uh, Dunloy's key forward in, in the Ulster final and I think he held him to maybe one point he marked TJ Reid you know, arguably the best hurler in Ireland and he held him to one point from play in the All-Ireland semi-final um, but that showed me what them guys can do if they get a chance to, to play hurling uh, for a number of weeks and, get, and prepare themselves to the very highest standards. So, look, of course our ambitions are to go the whole way to the top, but we, we'll take it as it comes with county championship first and we'll see where we go from there. Team Ulster, it's been talked about a lot. Do you think it can work? No, uh, I don't think Team Ulster will ever happen in the manner that it would have to happen if Team Ulster were to be competing at a Liam McCarthy level. I was asked a question a few weeks ago on another podcast um, that I think that uh, Team Ulster, the best 15 hurlers in Ulster would have a better chance of competing at Liam McCarthy than Antrim, who are the, I suppose, the standard bearers for Ulster hurling at the present time. And the answer is yes. You know, hypothetically talking, if you put the best 15 hurlers out from Ulster, I have no doubt that if they had the same preparation as any other county does, like Tipperary or Limerick or, or Wexford or whoever, um, they could compete with them. But it's never going to happen. One, Antrim have their own ambitions, and quite rightly so. They want to, to they're on the cusp of, of getting themselves into division one, if they can if they can win the Division 2 playoff against Kerry, um, which hopefully they will do. Um, once they get up there, they want to 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 compete with the Division 1 teams. They want to stay up there and, and improve themselves. They also want to win the Joe McDonough and, and try and gain entry to the Liam McCarthy on their own merits. You know, there's talk of Team Ulster without Antrim. Um, and yes, that might help to to improve the standard of of uh, or the level of competition that players in that team would get to. Um, they might also be able, without the Antrim players, to compete at Liam McCarthy level. But you know, it's it's just not going to happen because you know if you want to compete with Tipperary or Limerick, you need a panel of players who are working together, training together, playing together from November right through to the championship starts. You need to be playing in the National League to get the level of, of games to prepare you for the championship. And then, then you'll have a chance. That's not going to happen. Um, one, Antrim will not want to give up their 10 or 11 best players. Uh, two, you've mentioned three guys there who would be the top players coming out of Derry. They're also county footballers. They ain't going to go and train with the panel uh, from November. Um, but so my answer to it is no, Team Oster, a uh, 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 a, a total team Ulster will never happen. You know, hypothetically, it's great to talk about it. Uh, you know, it's great to have the conversations about who would your who would your top thirty players be, etc. But it's it's just never it's not going to happen. But there has to be something happening in Ulster. 
Ulster hurling is is not in a good place. Um, you know, there's no point in, in saying that we're you know that that everyone's rosy in the garden. It's not. Our underage teams aren't competing. Um, our senior teams, we've got one in the Joe McDonough, a couple of them, the Christy Ring, and the rest are, are down below that. And we want to try and get all those counties at higher level. But that has to start, in my opinion, that has to start at underage. Um, and there has to be a lot of work done both through schools and, and through the club underage, the county underage, and start building from the bottom. You know, you don't you don't build a house starting with a roof. You start with the foundations and build upwards. And and I think that's where where we have to to focus our attention and our energy here in Ulster. Do you think, say, if they put Team Ulster without Antrim into the Leinster Championship, they go into Division One B? Do you think it can work then? Do I think that a a a, a team of players, let's say the best. 25 hurlers in Ulster outside of Antrim. Uh, we're all together training and playing together like any other county team. I've no doubt that they could compete at Liam McCarthy and I've no doubt they would be in the Division 1B. But I'll go back to, Paul, to what I said earlier, Paul. It, it's not going to happen because the guys, if the guys from, for instance, from Derry are going to make that commitment, they're going to want to make it with everybody in Ulster into it. And that's not going to happen. Um, so, no... Uh, Right now, I would think that uh, Team Ulster is is a good conversation, but when we're talking at senior level, it's something that's never going to happen um, unless we start building from down at the lower levels and build it back, but build it upwards. And hopefully, by that time, we get the standard raised in each county that they're playing at a higher level. Um, but no, uh, or sorry, hypothetically speaking, yeah, the best players outside of Antrim could compete. And obviously, football is a big obstacle. Um, we see how competitive the Ulster Championship is in football. So really, they need to start promoting the games uh, at a young age, like starting from club underages, really, to get people to start pl playing hurling and to stop losing everyone to football. Is that the main issue you feel? Yeah, but look, I mean, if if you if you live in Derry, um, there's absolutely no doubt that. There is more, uh, there's more of a, a pull to go and play county football than there would be to play county hurling. Um, now, is that because of the standards? Is that because of the levels they're playing at? Well, you know, if you play county football for for Derry, you get to play in an Ulster football championship, an Ulster senior football championship, and that's quite prestigious. You know, that's there's big crowds, there's a lot of attention on that. Um, there isn't even an Ulster senior hurling championship to play in, so. Them guys are only getting the chance to go and play in Christy Ring. Um, there's a backdoor system in the football, which, you know, again, you can get to play the top teams. You can get to, to test yourself against the top teams. There's more of a there's more of a pull there for a player to go and play football. I think, Paul, it goes back to starting at the under -A. Start Get into the schools. Get into the schools and start working in the schools and then into the clubs. Clubs that don't have hurling. There's two or three clubs in Derry now who have had no history of hurling or, or background of hurling, but they started at underage. There's great work been done by guys like Kevin Hemphy um, to get hurling being promoting it in areas that before it would never have been played at. And that has to happen all over Ulster. It has to happen with the backing of, of the county boards, the Ulster Council, and, and from headquarters, GA headquarters. Right now, I think there's a lot of people just paying lip service to, to hurling in, in our province. And obviously there's counties that are struggling really apart from Antrim. Is your answer if there's no team ulcer to keep them counties the same and hopefully the work can go in in grassroots and that that will progress the game further in those counties? Sorry, Paul, I didn't catch that. Okay. Um, so basically you were saying that to put in the uh, work really at ground grassroots in these counties is your answer really to basically put put the work in a grass and hopefully the hello you hear me? I, I, I can hear you Paul I lost you there but I, I think I got your what your question was and if I'm answering it incorrectly let me know but no yeah I think the the, the correct answer is to start working at underage level. 
um, rather than talking about you know Team Oster because I just don't think Team Oster is ever going to happen. So look, it, it it was a good conversation to start uh, with and, and, and open up uh, lines of communication about Harlan and Oster. But I think the 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 root of the problem is deeper than, than senior level. The root of the problem is underage. It's areas where Hurling isn't promoted. It's clubs that don't have, uh, you know, Hurling of any kind being played. I know clubs, uh, very successful Camogie clubs, but they don't play any kind of Hurling, which I find very strange. Um, but I, I, and I know within some of those clubs, you know, anybody who would happen to mention starting Hurling would very quickly be, uh, would have very quickly be put down and, and told it's not, it's just not happening here. So, uh, you know, I think we need to try and get hurling stronger at underage level in every county, and I, I include Antrim in that. You know, we, we've got to try and get the Antrim minor team, the Derry minor team, the Down minor team, who are the three strongest counties. We need to get them competing at a level, um, at a higher level than they are at the moment. You know, the the current Antrim team uh, and are backbone by guys like Neil McManus, uh, who played. Uh, in the Leinster Minor Hurling Championship and mm -hmm. playing in the Leinster Minor Hurling League. And them guys will tell you that, that that was something, those competitive games that they got, you know, brought them to a level they probably wouldn't have got to before. We've got to get more of that. And we've got to look at our schools and get our schools competing. There's some great working on in, for Hurling in schools, um, like Cross and Passion, uh, like St Mary's in Belfast, uh, St Pat's in Mahara, St Louis in Ballymena. But there's just not enough of them. You know, we, we've got to get more. And um, now the club versus county affair, it's being talked about. The CPA are hitting out um, because they're not happy with the fixtures at all. Do you think there is going to be a backlash here between club and county? I think there's going to be difficulties, um, Paul. I think we're already seeing that. Um, you know, I, I read in the media, some counties are talking about playing off their hurling championship in three weeks or 23 days or something like that. Um, I mean, that's not doing anything for the club hurler. Um, it's it's probably given the county panel and the county player a better chance of success. But, you know, it's very elitist. Um, and I think there's going to be issues because if I, you know, if you look at any county, the county championships are going to run from the 31st of August or 31st of July through to the 11th of October. Um, Inter-county managers can, are only allowed to have their players from the 14th of September. What happens if you're still involved in club championship? Um, no manager's going to want his players going to play or to train with an inter-county team if he's got a championship match coming up the following Sunday. Um, so I think there's, there's going to be a lot of very difficult conversations. Um, there's going to be a lot of... Uh, unhappy people um, on both sides of the fence. But, I mean, I go back to what I said at the very start. In, in, in April time or March time when we were put into lockdown, we didn't think we were going to get any GAA. Maybe we should just be glad to, to get what we're getting and get on with it. Um, uh, you know, the fixers come out in Derry or the, the, the plan for, for the championships in Derry. If Slack Miller to be successful in hurling and football um, in Derry this year, they're going to have to play 12 championship games in 11 weeks. Um, I can tell you that's not ideal, but, you know, it is what it is and we must get on with it. And we've no doubt we're going to pick up injuries. It would be miraculous to go through that with, with such a, a large number of dual players and not have some kind of injuries that will, will mean that you'll be going to do a championship game missing players. But it is what it is. We've got to get on with it. But there is going to be there's going to be arguments, there's going to be fallouts, and there's um, there's going to be difficulties. And do you think there'll be players that are going to opt out to play in the club hurling because they have elderly parents? Yeah, again, um, you know the question we've asked the question to our players, um, and as yet no one has come back to say that they they're not happy about coming back to train or play. But I've no doubt. There's going to be somewhere in Ireland. There's going to be players who have, uh, whether they're elderly parents or parents with, or, or parents or siblings, maybe with respiratory issues or some kind of underlying health issues, that they're not going to be happy about it. But what has to happen there is, you know, management 
and 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 uh, fellow players must respect that person's decision um, and, and and not be putting them under undue pressure to, to come out and play. They, you know, if that's something they feel strongly enough about, then they, they should be allowed to do that. That's it's everybody's choice. And finally, Michael, do you ever hope to go into into county management? Yeah, I think so. Um, I suppose I was offered the opportunity to to take on the interim job um, back in 2018, um, but there, there was a couple of reasons why I, I, I didn't take it on. Um, you know, just family commitments at home, and I just had unfinished business. I felt with, with Slack Neil guys, I had asked uh, them to give me everything for four years, and. We were in the back of a 10-point defeat and lost our semi-final. I didn't think it was the right time to walk away from it. Um, and so, yeah, look, I mean, I, I would love to someday manage my own county. I would love to someday be involved in inter-county management. It's You're going to, to another level. You're going to go on and test yourself and see, against some of the, the, the top managers in the country, hopefully. Um, I would love to do that. I still see myself as serving my apprenticeship um, on the sideline in, in, in the club scene. So... Uh, I'm not too old, you know. I might look. I've got grey hair, and I might look. <laughs> I'm not that old yet. That, uh, there's a few years ahead of me, and, and uh, I'll just try to keep learning my my trade on the sideline, and, and try and make myself a better manager each year, and, and we'll see what happens. That's all for this week on the Backdoor Hurling Show. Thanks a million, Michael, for your time, and uh, wish you best of luck with Slack Neil for the upcoming season.